Terry Ryder, founder of hotspotting.com.au. My special guest presenter today is Andy Courtney of Plenitude Wealth, who is a member of Hotspotting's panel of partners. Today we're focusing on a topic which is critical to anyone who wants to invest in real estate and create a property portfolio rather than getting stuck, as so many people do after buying just one or two properties. Often what it comes down to is your borrowing capacity. Now, this is a topic on which I'm not an expert, but our guest presenter today, Andrew Courtney, certainly is. And today is going to explain how to uncover the game-changing potential of harnessing your borrowing capacity in the doubling game. Andrew, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Terry. It's been a, been a while since we last uh, chatted. It's, been, so, it's uh, been far too long. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, Talk more last, about it. Last time we did one of these together, uh, you were focused pretty much on the doubling game. And I know that this is something that you're passionate about. Um, what, what sort of um, interest are you getting from people out there about this concept? Well, look, to be quite frank, I haven't really gone out too hard with the doubling game, but it's definitely got some legs, mate, because, uh, I mean, the three core things, three core pillars of the doubling game is save more. So your cash flow, your surplus cash flow, tax savings, that's reinvested and invest better. So your return on investment on the net asset growth or on the net asset position. And um, it makes sense. So a lot of people actually find a lot of value out of understanding how it all kind of comes together. And it's certainly getting traction, not as fast as I'd like it to be though. So look out for more, more webinars and podcasts that I'll be joining um, in the very near future. That's for sure. Yeah. But today we're, we're focusing in particular on on borrowing capacity, which is so critical, particularly now. Um, it's, it's, it's the, I guess, one of the core issues in uh, residential real estate after 12, I think, rapid fire interest rate rises. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, look, the biggest the biggest pitfall that a lot of Aussies um, tend to fall, fall for when it comes to protecting their borrowing capacity is the fact that they go too big too early, right? So they go for a maximum maximum loan with a maximum borrowing capacity, and they don't realize that they're actually kneecapping themselves for future potential, right? So yeah. they're putting all their eggs in one basket, eggs being their full borrowing capacity, that, that major resource in um, in wealth creation, especially in the property space, right? Um, and unfortunately, they can't move for the next 5, 10, 15 years, depending on how fast they pay down their mortgage, right? And how fast the income uh, rental income increases within that in, with the property that they've got. Where yeah. most of them fall flat is that they're buying at low yields, extremely low yields, hoping for capital growth, but they get caught out on the deficit side of the equation, which yeah. actually affects their borrowing capacity even further. Right. It's, Especially it's, with increasing interest rates. Yeah. It's absolutely critical, isn't it, to get that first purchase as an investor, right? Because it can set you up for what follows or to prevent you from doing anything after making that first purchase, if you get it wrong. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, without a doubt. you gotta, you got to get it right. And, and, and I guess understanding the concepts that we're going to be talking about today will put people, especially in, in this audience, will put people in, in a position to have, ideally, unlimited borrowing capacity. Right? So that's my goal for today, for, for you guys, for the audience, to really kind of write a ton of notes to ensure that you can replenish your, your borrowing capacity. You don't necessarily have unlimited today, but, but certainly if you plan it out over the next few years and buy under the right entities, what happens is you can actually get there and replenish your borrow borrowing capacity over a, a medium and long term, basically. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you've got um, a presentation for us. Yeah. So let me share my screen with you. I'll, what I'll do is I'll reiterate what the doubling game is. And then what we'll do is just focus in on the borrowing capacity side of the equation and how it works within the context of your uh, investment portfolio, your property investment portfolio, and how you can get a higher return on investment on a year-to-year -year basis, right? Where most people go wrong is they forget the fact that their borrowing capacity is the catalyst for amplification of return on investment because people can actually get returns of upwards of 40, 50, 70% if they structure their portfolios as best they can with a little bit of strategy, right? So let me just get, go over what the doubling game is and then we can go straight into the interesting part, right? So what is the doubling game? Well, it's really as simple as this. If you start off with $1,000, 
right? And if you double it 10 times to two, to four, to eight, to 16, 32, 64, you get to $1 million, right? So 10 doubling cycles from 1,000 gets you to 1 mil, right? And then 10 more from 1 million gets you to a whopping $1 billion. So I have a feeling there's probably one or two, maybe five of us in this particular webinar that wants to get to a billion dollars worth of net assets, right? So it's really as simple as doubling 20 times in your lifetime, right? If you're starting off with $1,000. Now, the kicker is this. Most of us are starting somewhere here, right? So the big question is, what does point B look like? Because what you always need to do is need to understand what you're working towards, right? So back to income and capital, right? If you know what kind of passive income you want in your investment portfolio, right, i.e. 250, 350, and 450, right, what you can do is you can multiply by 20, and then you can get to 5 mil, 7 mil, and 9 mil, right? So you now have your point B, right? And that'll determine what actions you take within what timeline to achieve these particular numbers. Right. So first and foremost, you need to know what point A looks like. Some of you will be a net asset position of one mil, others at two and a half, others at five, others at 500,000 and below as well. So every single person is different. So what I suggest you guys do is have a think about, well, within the doubling game context, how many doubling cycles do you need to achieve to go through to achieve your particular numbers? Right. And we've created, we're currently creating as well, a borrowing, a, a doubling game calculator that I'll be sharing with you a little bit later so that you can, you can book in and you can actually get it as soon as we've completed it, basically. That'll show you your current trajectory. Because the three core things that I mentioned earlier when it comes to the doubling game is savings, right? Taxes saved and a return on investment on your net asset position or on your whole um, exposure, right? So we'll be focusing in on the return on investment, right, today. And just hyper-focusing so that we can get to a stage where we can speed up the doubling cycle. So instead of spending 30 years to get to your targets, why not collapse time and bring it back down to 10, 15 years, right? Because if you can get a return on investment of 40, 50, 60, 80, 100% returns on, your, um, on the capital that you're investing, guess what? You can get there a hell of a lot faster. Right. So, Terry, do you remember? Do you remember me talking about the doubling game last time? Yep. Absolutely. And um, keen to find more. I mean, it, there's a little bit to get your head around with the Absolutely. doubling game. Um, the, the 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 numbers get big as you go through the cycles, and um, I guess for some people, it's question: Could I ever possibly achieve that? Yes. Yes, that's it. And and ultimately, the accelerator is the return on investment on your net asset position. So you have to ask yourself what, what kind of resources are available to you. And today we're gonna to be going over your borrowing capacity, which is the number one resource to amplify the return on investment, especially within the property context, right? And what I always say is this, what you do in the first five years determines how comfortable you are in the next 10, right? So it's all about momentum building. If you can get that right, you can speed up the process dramatically and get to your version of financial freedom sooner, right? Now, some of you may remember that there are three parts to the portfolio journey, right? The first part is focusing in on growth assets, right? And then the next part of the journey, as you get closer to your capital targets, you are now playing the game to produce income from your investment portfolio because you may wanna start slowing down with work on part-time or whatever it may be, then the game becomes lowering tax payable. Right. So this is a bit of a, a framework that I would love for the audience to kind of consider as they plan ahead, because some people got a five year time horizon. Others have a 30 year time horizon. Right. So you need to kind of work out which stage of the process are you in and how much income do you want to have in your within your finances so that you can make the right judgment call and the right moves to increase the likelihood of achieving success. Right. So if we go through, <clears throat> I mean, the, the aim of the game is to speed up the doubling game, right? And the three core things is save more, lower taxes and invest better, right? So if you guys wanna sort of uh, get the doubling game calculator, feel free to take a photo of this, of this screen right here, where you can go over and you'll get the first copy, first draft of this. We're just currently finalizing it. So we'll be providing you with that via email as well.
right? So then the next thing is, well, we need to create our portfolio, right? And today we're going to be honing in on the property side of the equation, right? So in terms of risk return, right, we're looking at honing in on the property because the beauty of property is there are no margin calls. So if you can structure your finances as best you can, what happens, you can get a massive return on investment on the assets that you're, that allowed you to, or the funds to complete, that allowed you to control that particular property, right? That's when it becomes really, really interesting. And this is the beauty of this particular asset class within Australia, right? So what we want to do is we want to go from a position where if our target is the ideal income, right? And if you're going to get there over a longer time period, what we want to do is we want to save a number of years and get to our ideal income with our net worth sooner, right? And the hardest part is the liftoff. So what we want to do is you want to come up with a strategy where you are racing towards your ideal income, where you save more years because every single year, let's just imagine if your goal is $250,000 passive, right? And if you can get there four years sooner, that's literally $1 million in your back pocket, right? And the doubling game is the framework that allows you to actually speed up that process because you now have the levers that you can pull to maximize the return on investment, the taxes saved, and how do you save a little bit more, essentially, right? So the aim of investing better is to save years to financial freedom, if not decades for some of you guys, right? And with property mastery, the key thing is you want to acquire in strategic locations all around Australia, diversify a little bit, and make sure that your yield is higher than usual, right? So the average yields in capital cities at the moment is around that 3% mark, right? So you may want to acquire higher yielding investment property, especially at the start of your investment process, because your borrowing capacity is what determines how you can amplify the returns, right? And how, you, how much faster you can go again, basically. Now, in terms of where, what you want to buy, a good rule of thumb for us in our, in our business is to buy at or below median price. It's really as simple as that because you've got the opportunity to add value ASAP with a small cosmetic renovation, right? $10,000, $15,000 to get you potentially new floors, right? Paint, liquid paint, and some landscaping to get you a few rungs up the ladder. So for example, we bought a property of three ninety-five, dollars where you get a $15,000 renovation, and then six months later, it's valuing at five oh five. dollars so these are the kinds of ideas and strategies that you may want to consider if you're trying to speed up the process of utilizing your borrowing capacity and getting a high return on investment, right? Because what the borrowing capacity will allow you to get to is to utilize this particular strategy called the leapfrog strategy, where you're utilizing lazy equity from your property portfolio whilst maintaining your borrowing capacity the whole time. Right. In an ideal world, your property portfolio becomes a machine that pays for itself and funds future investments, right? That's the sweet spot. And where most people are going wrong is they buy the biggest home for the first one and they can't seem to buy the second and third because they're maxed out their borrowing capacity. And today, we're going to be going over what strategies you may want to consider to maximize that particular, that growth of your property portfolio. Any questions so far, Terry? Is that all making sense, mate? Um, it's all making sense. I, I just wanted to interject. Perhaps um, one of the key planks of what you're talking about is buying property with high yields, and it's probably pertinent to to point out that um, this week we have just published a new report which actually addresses that. Um, we've got a, a range of uh, reports in the in the in the stable which tell people good places to buy for capital growth. But this um, new report specifically. National top 10 positive cash flow hotspots, locations that have um, rental yields between 6 and 8%, but um, in locations which have also got good potential for capital growth, low risk locations, but with above average rental yields. So that is achievable if you know where to look. Yes, absolutely. And I'd get onto that straight away if I was looking to acquire something, because in the end of the day, it's amazing how how much of a deficit you'll have if you're buying yields at three, three or four percent, or some of some of some people are buying at two and a half percent at the moment. Right. The the deficit that you have on a one, one and a half, two million dollar property with that kind of yield is is quite a quite a debilitating uh, 
um, deficit in your in your hip pocket. And you so, also higher entry prices. Um, you know, yeah. The good news for investors is that uh, some of the places that are performing the best at the moment, the ones showing the best capital growth at present and for the foreseeable future are those uh, smaller capital cities or regional areas with low entry prices and higher rental yields. Yeah, 100%. And that's the only way you could actually build up a reasonable portfolio because you'll be stuck rolling the dice on one, two or three properties if you go too hard too fast in terms of the, the high value, low yielding uh, capital city properties, basically. Now, a lot of people get stuck with that, right? Um, one thing that I wanted to share is, is in terms of the mortgaging and, re and financing, because property is just the vehicle, it's just the asset, right? Where the alpha or the outperformance comes from is how you structure your debt, right? If you can structure your debt accordingly, and every single person is different in terms of the risk they're willing to take, right? So for example, for me, my goal is to get to 70% loan to value ratio. I've got a client who's currently at 19% loan to value ratio. And I was telling them, look, I'd be more comfortable if we go for 30 or 40, right? Because you've got so much more time. You've got so much more upside to kind of chase after. So it's really a balancing act between how much cash flow you've got and how much time do you want and how ambitious you want to be, right? So by understanding all of these things, what happens is you start to build a bit of a plan of attack. Because ultimately, each and every property, right? With a long enough timeline, we'll get to a stage where it starts to pay for itself, right? So the negatively geared properties are with, where the expenses are higher than the rent, right? Obviously, positively geared properties where, where the rent is higher than the expenses, right? Where the debt comes into it will determine how much borrowing capacity you have back, you get back, right? So I've been teasing you guys a little bit about the borrowing capacity side of the equation, but I just need to talk about the return on investment first, and then we can get into the strategies associated with the, getting your borrowing capacity back, right? So there are three core things in terms of debt to equity relationship. Where most people play is this, right? So they acquire a property, right? They've got high debt and lower equity, buying at 10, 20% deposit, maybe 30% deposit. Right. So what happens is as equity increases, debt decreases. Right. So that's the relationship over time. And typically over a 30 year period, it gets paid off. Right. So this is the typical Aussie. The return on investment or deposit relationship looks like this. So on the capital outlay, right, the initial 5% deposit on a, on a, and on a conservative 5% growth. Obviously, Terry and his team produces reports to get you 7, 10, 15% growth on a year-to-year -year basis with the properties that you acquire today, right? This is very conservative numbers, right? So on a 5% growth over that 30-year timeline, what happens is as the debt gets paid, you revert back to the mean, which is a 5% return on investment in terms of growth only. We're now ignoring the income side of the equation, right? So we're just talking about growth here. So in the first year, if you put a 5% deposit down, you can get as high as 35% uh, return on investment based off of a measly 5% growth on the property that you acquire. If you put in a 10% deposit, you're looking at a 27% return on investment. In a 20% deposit, we're looking at 21%, right? So what does it actually look like if you're getting 10% growth over time? Obviously, this jumps up significantly. Right now, the second part of the equation is for people who want to maintain the debt levels as is at interest only. Right. So instead of paying it down, what happens is over a 30 year period, the debt stays the same, the equity increases. So, what does that look like in terms of the return on investment on the capital outlay? Well, it looks like this it's a little bit higher. The, the steepness of the curve is, is elongated a little bit, basically. And the, the mean or the return on investment at 5% is a little bit higher, 6.25 up to 6.55 over the long-term percent growth, right? Because you've got a 20% loan-to-value ratio at the end of the journey, right? If you just kick the can down the road and if you go interest only and never pay that debt down, right? then you start to play in the space where you're starting to elongate and get a good return on investment, a much better return on investment at the start of the process. Because the game that we're trying to play is trying to squeeze out as much of an ROI as possible 
within the first five years, right? So if you start doing that, suddenly you start to build more momentum. And the third and final one is where people sort of start to think, holy crap, I didn't, I didn't know this was possible, right? It, it would be lifting up your property debt as your equity position increases. And this is where borrowing capacity, mastery of replenishing your borrowing capacity becomes very, very important, right? And what does it look like in terms of return on investment? It looks like this. So instead of reverting back to a 5% to 6% over the long term, you're now looking at 21% at an 80% loan to value ratio or a 16% ROI over the long term at a 70% um, loan to value ratio. So what does it look like at 60% loan to value ratio? Well, you're probably looking at 11% compounding on the capital that you've got invested on your property portfolio. So the question that you have to ask yourself is what is your current net asset return on investment, right? Because far too many people get that confused with the full, pro a full portfolio, right? And they don't really know where they're heading towards. And they're sort of hoping for the best. They've got their fingers crossed. So your loan to value ratio can determine a lot of the returns that you end up getting because that frees up some cash, some equity, so that you can go again. And where most people go wrong is they acquire under their names only. Right? So the sweet spot is this. You want to be acquiring under a trust. Right? especially with high yielding properties that starts to pay for itself, right? Because then you can start to maintain the loan to value ratios at 80, 70 or 60%, depending on what kind of risk you're willing to take, right? Thereby allowing you to get a much higher return on investment, recycle the, uh, the equity so that you can utilize and use this particular strategy, the leapfrog strategy, right? where you can utilize lazy equity from your existing property portfolio, go again and again and again and again until your heart's content. And what will slow you down, ideally, is your ambition. It comes back down to point B. What does point B look like? Are you aiming for 50 mil? Well, if you're aiming for 50 mil and you're currently at three, well, you've got some work to do, haven't you? Right? But if your goal is six mil and you got three, you're at three mil and you've got 20 years to achieve it, you probably don't need to do that much. So it all comes back down to what are you trying to achieve and how many actions do you need to take to get there faster, basically. So by buying under a trust, what happens is the banks will start to consider. So right now, if you buy under a trust, they'll consider both of your, uh, your full financials under the trust. But what happens is as soon as that property becomes positively geared and it starts to pay for itself, the banks will sever the relationship between you and the trust, thereby allowing you to increase your borrowing capacity once more. And this is the kicker right here, right? If you can maintain a positive cash flow property or get it to positive cash flow ASAP, what happens is you can get your borrowing capacity back, thereby allowing you to acquire another and another and another and another, right? Now, some rules of thumbs, uh, a rule of thumb that you may want to consider and some sort of guidelines around this, right? So with your bar borrowing capacity, the banks typically shade the, uh, the rental income by about 30%, depending on which bank. Some, of it, some banks go for 20%, some bank banks go for 30, 35, right? So if they go for a 70% shading, right? What you need to do <clears> is you want to make sure that you're acquiring high yielding properties and ideally under the trusts, right? To so get your you just, capacity back. Can you just clarify what you mean by 70% shading for those yes. who may not understand what you mean by that? So they will the banks will look at your rent and only consider 70% of it hmm. when they're calculating for their borrowing capacity or for, for lending. So if it earns 500 a week, they're not going to put five hundred dollars a week into their calculation. That they'll knock maybe 20 or 30 percent off that and consider 450. Correct. Dollars. 400, 350. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's pretty sad, right? So as a rule of thumb, right? If we're trying to work out how do we get unlimited borrowing capacity, we look at the rent that you end up getting from your investment property. So we can all do this right now. Every single one of us in this, in this particular webinar, right? You rent, multiply by 70%. That equals your property income that the banks will look at. And then you divide it by the best interest rate 
right? And that determines the loan amount you should have for that particular property under your trust so that you can go again, basically, All right? So let's have a look at an, an example because obviously this is quite esoteric a little bit. So if we go for an example at $700 per week rent, let's hypothetically say, obviously we can lower this or increase it depending on where you wanna be, right? At $700 per week, we multiply by 70%. At, and let's just assume a 6% loan is the best interest rate we can get at the moment. It means the loan that we've got is to get it at unlimited borrowing capacity or replenish your borrowing capacity. For this particular rent, we need a loan of $424,000, right? Now, if we look at the yields that you end up buying, and this is why I don't like buying low yields, right? What happens is this, the buy price on a 7% yield is 520, but on the buy price on a 3% yield is 1,210,000, right? And the loan to value ratios goes from 80%, 81% down to 35%. And where it hurts the most guys is the funds to complete, right? For the first one, if we want to get, if we want to replenish our borrowing capacity, we need to cough up one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars on the buy price of five twenty. If you're buying in capital cities at the moment and you're going for maximum borrowing capacity and you're replenishing your borrowing capacity, you would need to buy at a three percent yield a one point two one million dollar investment property with a loan to value ratio of just shy of thirty five percent with a whopping deposit of $827,000. That's the challenge, right? So this is why I tend to steer clear of low yielding properties at the moment because you're hoping and praying for the best. And unfortunately, you know, there's a portion of the portfolio that may not perform as well as you'd like, right? So really that's the challenge. Now, one thing that I did skip a little bit later, a little bit earlier is this limiting factor called the debt to income ratio, right? Currently, they're playing around the six times your income, your household income mark, right? Six to eight times, it can go as high as 10 times as well, right? So they're quite conservative. So as soon as the pendulum swings, it'll open up more borrowing capacity for you, but we can only control what we can control. So what happens is instead of, because what you can do is you can theoretically say, well, I'll just buy under my name, right? And just, and just acquire properties and hold on for the long term. And, and suddenly they'll all be positively geared. But what happens is this, your debt to income ratio will be another bottleneck for a lot of Aussies out there where they can't borrow more and they're stuck with where they are, right? So by having and acquiring under a trust, right? What happens is like I said earlier, they uncouple the financials of the trust because the assets within the trust actually pays for itself, thereby allowing the couple or the person, the investor, to replenish their borrowing capacity once more. Is that all making sense? Yeah, a few questions about, about trust and how you go about setting them up, where you go for that kind of advice. Is that something you're able to, to help people with or get them started? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So we absolutely, we can absolutely set up, establish some trusts up. A typical accountant or a lawyer can establish a trust for you as well, right? So what happens is it, there's an establishment fee, right? So the cost associated with a trust is the establishment fee and the ongoing compliance. So it really is, to kind of cut the long story short, it only makes sense for people who are serious about building their investment portfolio. Where people go wrong is that they sort of go into it thinking that they're going to get rich quickly. And then they realize, oh, crap, it's actually not worthwhile because the cost benefit analysis over a one or two year period just does not stack up. Right. But over a 10, 15, it changes the ball game completely. So you've got to think about it from a longer time perspective. The time horizon has got to expand out. Most successful investors are looking at a 15, 20 year time horizon. Unfortunately, the majority of investors out there are looking for a one or two, two year time horizon, trying to get a quick win, right? So by changing your mindset around the trust, it makes the fee absolutely worthwhile. So who can establish? Accountants typically, and lawyers are the ones that establish these things. Another question, Andrew, about trust. 
asking whether is there a particular portfolio size that the investor should have before establishing a trust? Look, uh, it, it comes down to how much income that that portfolio they got uh, that investor has, right? Because debt to income ratio is a real deal. Is going to slow your investment portfolio building down. Because if you hit a six times debt to income, let's let's just assume the household's earning 350K, right? Times six, 350 times six, we've got 2.1 mil worth of borrowing capacity for some of the banks with their policies, right? So for that particular person who's got two properties and with a loan of 2.1 mil, they're stuck now under their names. Whereas if one of these properties were bought under a trust, there is a chance if, if it's got enough yield, right? And the loan to value ratio is low enough where it starts to pay for itself. There's a chance that they can get one mil back of borrowing capacity, right? So it comes down to your income and how ambitious you wanna be when building your investment portfolio. Because some people are happy with three investment properties. Some people want to go for five. Others want to go for 20, right? So it depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you want to go for higher number of properties, the sooner you get into a trust, the better. Now, the problem with the trust is you can only go as little as 10% deposit down, right? You can't put a 5% nor do a guarantor under a trust at the moment, right? Now, policies may change, right? So but banks' policies may change. But right now, you're looking at a 10% deposit. So for the hyper-aggressive people out there who are looking at a 5% deposit or a 100% deposit through a guarantor with their parents, let's hypothetically say, right? Trust is not available. So you have to pick and choose the best kind of properties to buy under your name versus under a trust, right? So if you're a high income earning family, you, when you buy a property under your name, in an ideal world, you want to be having a fairly sizable deficit, right? To maximize tax deductions, right? So what kind of property is that? Well, a property with probably development potential that you can split into three or four blocks, basically. Low yielding, high deficit, high tax return under your name only, and then the rest can be high yielding under trusts. So it all depends on what you're trying to achieve. Every single point, every single person's point B is different. And every single point A, every single person's point A is different also. So it all depends on where you're at, right? But you cannot ignore building an investment property portfolio with trusts and as entities that own it, basically. One negative component about a trust is that you don't get a tax deduction under your name because you can't distribute the losses to the beneficiaries. So it has to stay within the trust for future earnings. Right? And that's the challenge for a lot of short-term investors. You see? Cool. More questions? Someone's asking, what does, should someone do if they're stuck with three investment properties in the individual's name? If they're stuck. So I'm assuming they're maxed out their borrowing capacity. That's probably what they're implying, yes. Yes. Well, one way of going about it is unfortunately, paying stamp duty and moving one under a trust, right? Because they probably hit the debt to income ratio ceiling, right? So what you can do is you can change the ownership from a person to a trust. But the problem is you've got stamp duty payable. What does that equate to? Approximately 3% of market value. Then the question is, well, what is market value? So then you got to ask yourself, well, how can you get a valuation that's as low as possible so that you're not having to pay 3% stamp duty on the max market value? Because obviously it's a range. Until you actually sell it, right? You're never going to know what the actual market value is. So in an ideal world, you get one or two valuers to come through and you make the house as, as excuse my French, I was going to, I was going to say, I was going to swear there, but as, as crappy as possible, present it the worst way you can so that they value it as low as possible, therefore allowing you to transfer it under your trust and then just do a little spring spring uh, um, clean and hey presto, you got your house back and you're paying a lower um, stamp duty cost. That's one strategy to lower the uh, stamp duty uh, payable on the market value of the house, right? So Jonathan's asking, is it one trust per pro property or do you have all properties under one trust? 
Yes. Well, look, if you have all properties under one trust, what happens is you get a, you're getting a deficit for some properties and a positive under others. Therefore, the banks will never um, let go of the trust. They don't sever the relation, your financial relationship with the trust. So it depends on your current strategy, how long you want and when, how ambitious you want to go. The hyper ambitious out there will, will establish one trust per property. The people who are a little bit more patient, who are happy to acquire once every five years, will acquire multiple properties under a trust. So it all depends on what you're trying to achieve. So it's always a situation, I think, that um, everyone's situation is different. and There's no one size fits all. It comes down to the individual circumstances, and they need to sit down with someone like yourself and um, talk, talk about their individual situation and devise a strategy that's unique for them. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, look, the 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 one size fits all approach is to save more, lower taxes, invest better, right? Back to the doubling game, right? And then all of the nuances comes along depending on where you are, point A, and where you want to go, and how ambitious you are, and what kind of timeline you want to get there by, right? That's where the problem lies. Because right? there's a lot of kind of broad brush approach kind of information out there. And to sort of make it make more sense for your particular situation, it's very, very difficult, right? So you ideally want to have a team around you that can articulate these things freely and, and in a way that you can understand, right? Because it's very confusing if you don't really know what levers you've got available to you to pull. Like I always say to people, Andrew, that you need to build your team before you build your portfolio. And I think it's a mistake a lot of people make is that they get into property investment without um, building a team of experts around them, whether they're accountants, lawyers, um, buyers, agents. Um, very important to take those early first steps before you start spending big money on real estate. Because if you get that first run wrong, you can um, blow the whole strategy. Yes, unfortunately, and and a lot of uh, unfortunately, a lot of Aussies aren't aware. That they get it wrong until until they go down five, 10 years down the track and they realize, oh crap, I should have, would have, could have. You know? So that's the last thing you want to do, basically. Right. So, so yeah. Any other any other questions that come to mind? Um, Helen's asking whether the strategies that you're articulating um, work equally for a self-managed super fund. Well, with the self-managed super fund, you the, you can't do the leapfrog strategy. Unfortunately, you can't you can't pull that with the current rules. Obviously, it may change. Right? With the current rules, you can't utilize refinance um, in a self-managed super fund. Pull out equity and go again, right? So, with the self-managed super fund, you can only buy and sell. You typically can't renovate. You can only fix, right? So, yes and no is the answer to that one. You can absolutely acquire properties through a self-managed super fund and thereby allowing you to get 24, 50% return on investment because some, believe it or not, some lenders out there in self-managed super fund world will allow a 90% loan to value ratio, right? There's only one lender, I should say, not some. Um, so others will go for 70%, right? And 80% with, with where most of them will, will max out at, right? So you have to ask yourself, well, how fast do you want to build your wealth? How much time do you have? How ambitious you are? That kind of thing. So absolutely you can, but um, there are more rules within self-managed super funds and you want to make sure that you dot your I's and cross your T's with that stuff because if you get it wrong, there's, there's obviously more rules and more uh, complications if you don't do it correctly, basically. And back to your team. You got to have a team of advisors behind you to ensure that you're doing the right thing and playing by the rules. That's, you know, just... It's worth repeating. It's so so important before you start to to build your team before you build your portfolio. I think it's um, so fundamental to success with property investment. Um, Raj is asking, wanting to clarify a point: Can I buy multiple uh, positive cash flow properties in the same trust, and the bank will sever financial relationship with the individual as long as they are positive cash flow? Correct. Yes, with with the seventy percent of the rent, absolutely. But the problem with that is you can have to come up with pretty sizable deposits, right? So if you're really cashed up, you could theoretically buy three under under a trust. If you can get a 7% yield, well, 20% deposit will get you there, right? But if you're buying at 5% yield, you're going to need to come up with about a 40% deposit or 45% deposit each property to get it up to a stage where the banks will happily sever your financial relationship with the trust. 
Okay. Wow. Now a question about how you borrow in a trust. Is it harder than individual borrowing? No, it's the same. It's the same. So the, the, what happens is that you, you've got your trustee, which is a typically a corporate trustee. You and your partner, you and your wife, you and your husband, right, will be the directors of the corporate trustee and thereby guaranteeing the loan in the first place. Until such a time where the asset starts to fund itself, you, you're guaranteeing it, basically. Okay. So questions are continuing to come in. Do you want to continue? Have you got more? Yeah, I've got a few, I've, I've got a few more kind of points to go over. All right. So a lot of a lot of the uh, um, audience, I'm sure, are sitting in a position where they haven't maxed out their borrowing capacity. Right. So this is for those people who haven't maxed their borrowing capacity yet. I.e., the debt to income ratio is not at six to one. Right. So. For those kinds of individuals, what I suggest you guys do is have a think about what kind of lazy equity you've got sitting in your portfolio, right? What kind of return on investment are you currently getting from your net assets, right? And you may want to consider pulling some of the um, lazy equity out to invest under a 5% deposit, 10 or 20% deposit, depending on how much risk you're willing to take, i.e. cash flow burden or a deficit on a year-to-year -year basis, right? Thereby allowing you to amplify your return on investment, the third pillar of the doubling game, right? Because if you can bump up your, your return on investment by an extra $30,000 per year and not changing or just slightly changing your cash flow by five ten thousand $10,000 per year, right? That will put you in a much better position, i.e. over the next 15 years, you could get as high, well, if you're conservatively kind of a, um, assuming 6% uh, growth on a year, year per year basis, right? You can get as high as $600,000 worth of upside over a 15 year period, right? So the question is, well, why aren't you maxing out your borrowing capacity? And why aren't you strategic, strategically utilizing it so that you can actually get to your goals faster, right? It all comes back down to comfort levels and understanding, right? If you don't know what you're doing, obviously you're not gonna be making moves. If you're working with a team, back to Terry's point, what happens is it speeds up the process dramatically for you and you can sleep easy at night. I call this thing the sleep test, right? If, you, if you're losing sleep at night, you should, probably shouldn't be doing it, right? It's really as simple as that, right? So if you're looking to debt recycle, it's absolutely possible to do that. Utilize your equity, the lazy equity that's actually saving you around interest rates of 6%. So so long as your return on investment, excuse me, your return on investment is higher then your cost of capital of 6%, it makes sense to go for it, right? Because if you can get, let's let's say you acquire a $400,000 property, whoops, and you put down, let's just call it 50K to control that, the asset. Over one year, it becomes 440. Excuse my messy handwriting. All right, so we got a 10% uplift, right? So we've got plus 40K, but it's costed us, let's just call it 7K of cash flows. So your net output is $33,000, but you put in 50K, right? To control the $400,000 investment property. So what return on investment is that? 66.6% return on investment. This is possible, but that's quite aggressive. Right. Then the question is, well, what if you put 100K? Well, I'll take a 33% return on investment. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. So it all depends on what kind of return you're after, how aggressive you are, and how much borrowing capacity you have left. Right. And the beauty is, so long as you've got an exit strategy, you can play this game in your late 50s and certainly in your 60s as well. Right. So for people out there who are keen to sort of kick the ball around and have a chat with me, I'm happy to spend 30 minutes with you, right? To, to go over your options, ask me as many questions as you'd like, and we can see where we end up, basically. Lots of, lots of uh, um, information. Obviously, I've come at you with a ton of, of information with like a fire hydrant, right? So if you want to sort of uh, get down to the nitty gritty about your personal circumstance, 
and we can look at it from a con from the context of the doubling game. I'm happy to spend 30 minutes with you and just go over it step by step and see what your options are, basically. We've got a team of professionals in our, in our business that allow you to maximize the opportunity that you've got in front of you with the resources that you have available, basically, right? And if you don't, if you, the scan doesn't particularly work right now, what we can do is we can send you an email anyway because we will get some emails and we'll send you an email with the links um, to, to download the Dublin Game Calculator along with booking the time with me to, to go over your per, personal finances. Cool. Any other questions that come up, Terry? Lots of questions, Andrew. Um, here's one. Uh, is the uh, DTI based on personal and rental income and personal names only, or does it take into account trust income until it becomes positively geared? Yes, look, it, it's it's typically the full um, full income in the whole portfolio. Some banks only look at your personal income. Other lenders look at the whole thing. So it it all depends on the on the banks and their risk appetite at the time. Okay. Uh, just scrolling through, we've already handled some of these. Um, I was asking, what if the property yield is say 15%, perhaps we're, we're thinking of a, a small commercial industrial property or retail in that case, rather than residential. But uh, the question is, what is the, uh, what if the property yield is 15%, what LVR can you borrow at under a trust or as an individual? Let's assume it's commercial. You can you, you can borrow at seventy percent and it'll fund itself, and you you probably don't even need to you probably don't even need like Macquarie will just fund that automatically if, you, if it's yielding fifteen percent the banks will literally throw money at you, right? So all you need is the is the minimum deposit and off you go, basically. Right? So high yielding property is is really the the goal, right? Because that lowers your risk, it lowers the bank's risk tremendously. And allows them to to keep to keep uh, going. Yep. Okay. Uh, just just harking back to an earlier question about whether it's um, an easy matter to borrow from lenders with a trust. Um, Chris is making the point that some lenders don't like trusts, and um, I've certainly experienced that as a as an investor. So he's suggesting that perhaps uh, having a great mortgage broker on the team is critical. I would certainly agree that a, yeah. a good mortgage broker is an essential part of the team that you need to build before you build your portfolio. 100%. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, look, you're going in there blind if you don't have, if you don't have access to all this information. Obviously, you can do, do a bunch of research and be an absolute guru um, at this. But the problem is it might take you a couple of years to work it out. And the problem that you're facing is that the policies change sometimes on a month to month basis. <laughs> so good luck trying to find it all out. So by working with the right mortgage broker, what happens is they do all the legwork for you, right? And you get some peace of mind around getting the best deal. Yeah, I've been in the office of, of mortgage brokers and there's this constant flow of information coming from lenders because there's dozens and dozens of different lenders out there. And there's a constant flow of information, the latest deals, the latest offers. It's changing almost daily. And it's, um, I don't know how they keep keep on top of it all, but certainly I think the average um, investor would find it almost impossible to um, to keep up to date and with all the best deals and the various permutations. Very difficult. I mean, unless you're you're cruising around all, all the banks and just asking them and constantly keeping an eye on the market, and spending a few hours, a lot of hours of your time staying on top of it, is is it's it's impossible to stay on top of it all, right? And, and get a higher return on investment for your time, you know, because you, you have to look at your your hourly rate as well. Because a lot of the research that you're doing may be redundant, because you could literally just talk to someone and have a a ten minute conversation with someone, and they can do all the research for you because they've already done it or they're staying on top of it, right? Yeah. Another question about trust. John was asking, do you own each trust or is there a trust that owns each trust? Well, it depends. I think, I think in the end, you can, be a, the, you can be the director and the shareholder of the company, the trustee for the trust. And that's probably more than enough for a lot of people. But if you've got multiple generations in a family, for instance, then you can start getting more and more complicated if you want it to be, right? For example, if you're a patriarch or a matriarch, of a, a two, three generation kind of family, and you want to help your your um, your the other generations set them up for the future. 
you could you could certainly make it very very complicated um, and build it up accordingly um, and have it like trickle down and or trickle up in terms of the the, the ownership. Yeah, so that's that's corporate structuring basically. So absolutely. Yeah, and a related question and about mortgage brokers and borrowing. Um, Raj is asking, would you suggest staying with one bank for all your property loans, or does it make sense to shop around? Yeah, definitely makes sense to shop around. You don't want to be you don't want to be stuck in one bank because they've got this all money's clause and they'll typically train you. I mean, the, the lenders in banks will are trained to cross collateralize everything. What does that mean? Well, it means every single property in your portfolio is bundled into one. So the outperformers, you won't be able to pull lazy equity out and go again because you'll be looking at the, the banks will be looking at the full portfolio rather than the outperformers only, right? So by keeping it separate, it allows you to have that flexibility and the maneuverability to be proactive in your approach, thereby speeding up velocity of money. Yeah. And the reality today is that loyalty to your bank is not rewarded by the bank. Um, quite the opposite, in fact. Um, you need to shop around. I think investors, um, anyone with a mortgage needs to be constantly shopping around. Yes. Particularly, you know, we, we, we've had another interest rate rise, um, but the interest rate that the bank's charging you may be not the interest, the best interest rate they're offering to new customers. And uh, to, get the, yeah. to get the best deals, you've got to keep um, moving or threatening to. Yes, yes, without a doubt. Or you can get your mortgage broken and knock on their door every six months, right? You yeah. get a deal. Or every rate rise, you get a, you ask for a deal. We constantly do that for our clients. Yeah, yeah well, a, a good mortgage broker will, um, they don't just organise a loan for you and forget forget about you once the deal is done. They will come, come back and review and um, contact you um, with some of the possibilities how to improve your situation if they're a good mortgage broker. Yeah, so a very valuable um, entity to have on your team. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because it, it definitely pays for itself without a doubt because it's typically a low cost anyway, you know, low to no cost. Yeah. Other than your team. Yeah. Andrew, there's quite a number of questions with um, lots of facts and figures and numbers, and it's a little bit difficult to deal with in this forum. Um, and it relates to the comment we made earlier that everyone – it's got a different situation. There's no one size fits all. And it's, I think, important for the individual to sit down with someone like yourself and talk about their situation so you can start talking about solutions to their individual and unique problems. Absolutely. Without a doubt, because you're going in blind, guys. Like if you, if, you, if you do it by yourself, what happens is you're hoping for the best. And don't get me wrong, a hundred of you, if you're 100 of you go, in, go ahead and do it, there'll be five to 10 of you who smash it out of the ballpark, right? Unfortunately, there'll be a large portion of you wondering, will be scratching your head thinking, oh, damn, I should have done X, Y, Z. And others will just blow it up and take yourself out of the investment game altogether, right? So there's always a bell curve when it comes to these things, right? So, so luck, you, you want to take as much luck out of the equation as possible. And you want to work with people who can get you your money back sooner rather than later and build momentum ASAP, right? Because if you're going in half cocked, what's happening is you're not exactly optimizing for the best outcome. What you need to do is understand the resources available to you and put it together in a way to get a synergistic result. So that instead of getting one plus one is two, we're looking one plus one is seven, eight, nine, or 10, right? That's the goal, right? By understanding how it all kind of melds together, you can start to build massive momentum for the future. And, and then what happens is you get very, very excited because as soon as you get proof of concept, right, it's amazing some of our clients who actually go through this thing and just stick it out. What happens is they get this, uh, um, you, you see that they, they, they don't feel as much financial stress anymore. <laughs> they just think, you know, it's going to be easy, basically. So once momentum is built, life becomes a hell of a lot easier because you get a ton more options um, to, to choose what you want to do with your most valuable commodity, which is your time. Absolutely. Andrew, um, we're getting close to um, the time we need to wrap it up. I'd just like to end by um, urging people to, to follow up and make contact. Are you able to, to feature on screen again the, um, the contact details? Yeah, let me, let me put it on the... Uh, let me share again. Mm. 
and I'll also throw it in the chat box as well. Latitudewealth.com.au is the uh, is our website. You can click on the Let's Chat button and we can have a 15-minute conversation. Otherwise, if you want to spend more time with me, you can go through and have a look at this particular this particular QR code right here, right? And and we can talk more basically. So book in a time, we can go over your specific circumstance and if we can add value, we'll certainly be sharing all the information that we've talked about today within the context of your situation, right? Where most people go wrong is unfortunately they, they assume it's the same for them when in fact it's totally different. So feel free to scan this QR code or just check planitudewealth.com.au or let me provide you with a link for this QR code as well on the chat box. So feel free to just go on the chat and click on this particular link. And that'll, that'll get you to my calendar and then we can go over exactly how it's gonna look for your specific, specific circumstance. Okay, so that's there in the, in the chat box. Okay. All right, we've, um, as, as we always do with our, our webinars, we, we have a poll um, asking people whether they found the webinar very informative, somewhat informative, not so informative, or a complete waste of time. And the good news is that um, pretty much 99% of those who responded to the poll today, Andrew, have found it informative or mostly very informative. That's a good okay. sign. Love to um, hear. As an individual, when um, I'm listening to you explain those concepts and thinking about my own situation, my brain starts to wake. And I imagine that there'll be a few people out there like that, you know, um, would, I think the best way forward is to sit down with somebody like yourself or a member of the team and talk about their individual situation. And then some clarity can start to be achieved and some solutions, a way forward, a strategy to get where they want to get to. But they need to start by, by talking to um, somebody like uh, the team at Plenitude Wealth. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or the trade-off is... You pretty much do it all yourself, do all the research yourself and spend as many hours as you need to, to get to the level that we're producing, basically, right? So for some people who never get there and others will get there in a few years time. <laughs> most, of, most of us are time poor. And I think, I think the, the smart way is to be willing to spend some money um, rather than bucket loads of your own time to get faster results and better results by tapping into the expertise of people who have done it. I think... Um, it's false economy, I always think, to, to do it any other way. Yeah, I believe so. I mean, like for me, I spend tens of thousands of dollars on a year-to-year -year basis talking to mentors like yourself, Terry, right? Like other, other mentors out there within business, within, within building portfolios, all of that kind of stuff, because I know it allows me to be able to articulate these lessons to our, towards our clients and to come onto these particular webinars and do a hell of a job teaching these individuals so that it becomes something that's interesting, right? And and more and consumable as well, right? Because the yeah. concepts are quite complex if you allow it to be. But if you understand how it all kind of comes together, like the professionals that you should be working with are the ones who are able to articulate these things in a simplified manner so that a five-year-old ideally can understand, basically. Right? Yeah. So but I think mentors are so, so important. I think that's one of the keys for everybody I mentor people with property investment, but I have mentors and my mentors have mentors. And I think the cycle um, never stops. Even people you imagine wouldn't need a mentor because they've been so successful. I always try to improve so they have mentors as well. So I, I urge yeah. people to consider that as, a, as an early step in the process of uh, moving forward, growing your wealth and getting to where you want to be. Andrew Courtney from Plenitude Wealth, well, thank you so much for it. Uh, another interesting and fascinating and informative um, presentation. Um, the poll suggests that people did find it very informative. And uh, I hope that many of those people watching and listening today will follow up and speak to your team to try and um, get some benefit from the expertise that you have and uh, in, in growing their own situation. Excellent. So always a pleasure working with you, Terry. Um, thank you all for your attention. I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Let's do it again soon. Fantastic. Chat soon. Bye, Bye for now.